On today's show, I have Dr. Fenske joining me. Thank you so much for being here. She is a board certified gynecologist, an integrative health expert, so much more. We're going to learn all about that on today's show. Dr. Fenske, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you and very grateful that you're here and we're going to learn some more about you and some of your thoughts about endo and all of that on today's show. So why don't you just chat with us a little bit, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into medicine and just give us an intro. Sure. Uh, So yeah, I'm board certified OBGYN, traditionally trained. um, And uh, I think I was just one of those person always knew I wanted to be a doctor. I just love the human body, medicine, understanding it and helping people. Um, and then, uh, I did my residency OBGYN and afterwards did a two year laparoscopic robotic fellowship, um, at, um, at Mount Sinai, uh, and stayed on at Mount Sinai to, and really kind of specialized in pelvic pain endometriosis and doing a lot of surgery at that time, uh, on these women. It was actually my endometriosis patients that motivated me to look further and look for more answers. Uh, which is why I then sought out uh, integrative medicine two-year fellowship with Dr. Andrew Weil, which was beautiful and life-changing um, because I kind of wanted to approach all aspects of, of female health care from a more comprehensive approach. Uh, and then during the course of that, I also went on to be trained in functional medicine because I kind of wanted to get down to the root cause analysis of, of medical issues as well. I mean, I find that to be incredible and thank you coming from the perspective of just a patient who's been through so many things and found my path to more natural medicine. I would say just because of endo specifically being chronic, but I have Hashimoto's too. And I, and I just really appreciate that. So Dr. Andrew, well, like I remember years ago, like reading his books and like following, I don't know, I probably age myself here, but before social media, like blogs and things like that, where I was just very interested in learning all the things. So I'm sure that that course was just incredibly eye-opening of like how the body works together. Right. And this is something I think probably everyone on the show would be very interested to learn more about, um, kind of like top level, but as a doctor really, are you trained to treat symptoms, like traditional medicine, like you're treating a lot of symptoms where like looking at it from the other approach is like a whole body approach. Is that accurate? And kind of what you've learned and seen in the two different approaches? You're a hundred percent right. You know, there's, there's a lot to learn in medicine in a very short period of time. Uh, And I think because of that, unfortunately, the training is fantastic in being a great surgeon, being someone who really knows how to manage medications and so on and so forth. Um, But no, I will say the different aspects of that go into more comprehensive approach. Nutrition is barely taught in medical school. Uh, (laughs) Really not much knowledge. There's definitely never really conversation about supplements. It's the rare supplements that actually get attention. And even if you review research and the data behind it, um, it's, it's just not something that's really studied because supplements are not FDA approved. Right. And I think they're getting a little bit better with medical school in looking at kind of stress skills and stress management skills, but more so for the physicians to avoid burnout. Uh, I don't know if a lot of physicians kind of, you know, take that information and really apply it to patient care either. So integrative medicine really, you know, it approaches tr- the doing the traditional training and not saying no to medications and surgeries when needed, but also looking at how healing can really be better and long lasting and looking at all these other different modalities that go into someone being sick, right? I I mean, that's like music to my ears to just hear you say that as someone, again, with endo who in the beginning, I thought one surgery, and I want to get into this a little bit with you, but I was like one surgery and I'm going to be fine because I didn't understand what, what I was getting into. I didn't understand what the disease was, but I I want to dig into that a little bit, but just going back to your interest, just in women's health and endometriosis, is it in the beginning, you saw patients coming in that were like struggling with this disease or maybe other things, but there was just a lack of information. So you wanted to dig in more or was it more like very empathetic, probably both I'm guessing where you were like, these people are suffering in so much pain. And there's like, 
there's no answers here. Like how, how did you get to where you really wanted to focus more on this? It was a couple of things, you know, I saw so many wonderful women who had, who were, you know, in their early thirties and had already had three or four laparoscopies um, and were coming to me for their fourth or fifth laparoscopy. Yeah. And it just didn't, you know, it didn't add up to me that anyone would need to have that frequent uh, surgical intervention for a disease, because we know, we know the damage that surgery causes in its efforts also to ameliorate, right? Right. Um, And so that was one aspect. And then I had this, you know, large group of women too, who were just in so much daily pain um, that they were on narcotics and they were miserable. You know, I think that people always forget um, that nobody wants to be in pain or on pain medications, right? Right. Um, And in medicine, there's always this kind of concern people are drug seeking and this and that, right? But I've never met somebody who's like, yay, please put me on daily narcotics. <laughs> right. <laughs> want to do it. They want to live their life. You want to feel normal and you don't want to have that. So I think that the two together being that you're kind of your only options really for management of endo were either I give you a pill, birth control pill, whatever, whatever, whatever. I do surgery on you or I give you narcotics. And that just did, did not jive with me. And there had to be a better way to be able to let women at least live the most out of their life. Yeah. That, I mean, thank you. Is that, I mean, it's just incredible to hear. And I appreciate that so much because we just need more doctors that see it from that approach like you do. Right. And so I'm curious now, how do you treat patients? So I would say for me, like I've had several surgeries, unfortunately, but I've also worked with a natural doctor. I'm on supplements. I try to keep my diet in check. I mean, I'm not perfect, but there's a lot of things that I've done that actually really have helped. And it doesn't mean that I'm hundred percent all the time, but there are things that I've noticed that really helped. And when you mentioned pain medication, I'm someone who just doesn't tolerate birth control or medication well. And I'm curious if you've seen that with other patients, but so I knew that there was no way that I was going to be able to take like da- daily pain medication, even though I was in pain every day. So I ha- I was almost forced into a more natural route. So my question to you is, do you see that often where patients feel like they get kind of forced into this? I need something daily. Surgery is not going to be the only thing. How do you, how do you treat patients? How do you do things now? Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that initially when I was traditionally taught, I was more focused in on kind of the estrogen component of endometriosis and not even understanding why, you know, why is your body not balancing out its hormones enough and, and really looking deeper into that. I think now I focus more on kind of a root cause on let's focus first and foremost on kind of this hormone imbalance that exists. Um, And then also really to focus in on the inflammation aspect of endometriosis, because that's what's causing so much of the pain. So I think that that's what's really changed with me is really zeroing in on inflammation and focusing my attention on that. Yeah. So what are honestly, it's, it's very rare that I do surgery. And I think that there's very, I think that there's much fewer reasons to do surgery on someone for endometriosis than what traditionally has been taught and what still currently is being done. And that that's also really refreshing to hear, not only to mention, there's just so many people that can't access surgery. They may not have medical insurance or if it's excision, it's out of network. There's the access to care for endo patients is also just such a big thing that isn't talked about very often. It's okay. Well, here's birth control, which doesn't work for a lot of people. So what are some of the things, and I know obviously your doctor, so this isn't, this is not medical advice for everybody (laughs) listening, but what are some of the tips that you give patients to help keep inflammation in check? I know that that's something that I also try to just be very cognizant of. I think it's really important to a few things, right? There's kind of pillars of it when you approach it. You want to make sure that that to start, right, is have really, really good sleep, okay? And it's hard. It's really hard. And I will say that I often notice that women who have endometriosis also really aren't sleeping well. And it's kind of this vicious circle, right? Obviously, the pain and so on is keeping a woman up. Um, 
And even in that loop, which actually I'll go into the next pillar with that, but uh, so focusing really in on sleep and really making sure that sleep is adequate and restorative for the body, then kind of zeroing in on diet, right? You know, what we put in our bodies encourages or discourages inflammation. Um, and there, of course, you know, it's, it's super easy to, I don't think that you have to, you know, necessarily work with a nutritionist or necessarily, you know, cut out all these groups of food. I think that even to start with for people who kind of don't have access to the, the right uh, care in regards to nutrition, and also might not have the, the ability to financially afford nutrition, right. Working with a nutritionist is even starting with like the Mediterranean diet, right. Mediterranean diet is a classic anti-inflammatory diet. And if you look at the components of it, it is, um, it's, what's going to help heal the body and keep everything the way that it should be. So even starting with on the most basic level, doing the Mediterranean diet. Now, sometimes there are situations when somebody is uh, more sensitive to dairy, more sensitive to gluten, and these things can exacerbate too. But there shouldn't be a blanket statement that no one with endometriosis can tolerate gluten or no one can tolerate, you know, dairy or sugar. Um, but I think that a good guideline, you know, if you're, if you're not seeing somebody who's integrated functional is to start with like a Mediterranean diet with endometriosis. So sleep and diet and I definitely use supplements. I'm, I use them very judiciously. Um, look, in an ideal world, it would be great that if we got all of our nutrients from our food, right? Not going to happen. We're all human. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And in addition, there are things actually that we're still not going to get from food that can really help with endometriosis. Um, so judicious use of supplements and kind of really approaching that from the inflammatory aspect as well. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I feel so sorry for a lot of women who suffer from endometriosis because there tends to be this, this association still to this day of, um, being histrionic, being depressed, being anxious. And it's true, right? Anxiety and depression come along with endometriosis, but it's due usually to the endometriosis. It's not what's causing the endometriosis and it's not what's causing the symptoms. But if you're unable to kind of get a hold of that aspect of things too, then there's no way that you're going to be able to feel better and deal and manage with your pain. So stress management skills are a huge thing for me. Um, and really making it part of like your daily practice, not just using it in the moment of things. Right. Right. And I, I agree with those tips and you triggered me to think of a story of, I re I mean, this year, 2022, I talked to an endo patient who was, had an MRI. I mean, I believe things were showing up in the MRI, but still was referred to seeing a therapist versus acknowledging the pain. So like what you even just said is, so then that's just causing more stress and anxiety and depression because you know, something's wrong and, and you're not being heard. So that's, that's right. very challenging. And often um, MRI will not pick up endometriosis or sonogram, yes. right? I mean, unless you right. have an endometrioma or you have deep infiltrating endometriosis, it's not going to pick up a superficial endometriosis, which can cause just as much pain, if not more than the visually apparent endometriosis, right? Yes, for sure. And it's going back to stress management and I'm a, a type A, I will admit it type A. I'm sure people on the podcast already know this about me, but I really like, I would meditate here and there, but since the pandemic, every single day, I try to do at least 10 minutes and it's not perfect all the time. And sometimes I fall asleep and sometimes I can't stop thinking, but I've noticed it helps my reactions, even mm -hmm. like when I'm in a stressful situation or I'm in a meeting where normally I would maybe like respond quickly. I, I, I do feel calmer overall, which I think also helps just keep my like nervous system calm. So when you say stress management, and I know some people are like, I can't meditate. There's no way I can do it. What are some of those like stress management tips that you give patients as well that listeners can maybe start trying? Yeah. I mean, I do, I do love meditation. I personally 
do it daily. And I always joke that I'm a, I'm a meditated type A personality. So I'm, I'm an extreme type A, but you wouldn't know it because I really do attribute it to the meditation, but I understand. I will say that there's a lot more tools now for meditation and there's a lot more types of meditation. Everyone thinks it means you're just going to sit in one spot, be quiet, right? right? And not think about anything, right? But it's not, you can do walking meditations, you can do forest bathing, right? Like going for nice walks in the woods, which might be really soothing. Um, you know, yoga is a form of meditation too, movement meditation also. Um, so there's a lot of options in regards to meditation. And I think that we tend to stereotype it into a kind of one box and put it there. Uh, and there's nice, fun tools now. We have, you know, we have the Headspace app, we have the Calm app, uh, Peloton has, <laughs> you know, a whole section on, on meditation too. And then there are some fun tools like the Sensate, um, which is costly, but is a, it is a good tool for kind of really getting you into that meditative state faster. But besides meditation, if you've really decided that you don't want to do yoga, you don't want to do any of those things, um, I will say going back for a second, Melissa, that exercise is another pillar of this. And usually yoga is my one that I recommend the most for endometriosis. But yeah. even if you feel like meditation is really not the thing for you, then even doing daily breath work, right? And even daily breath work, not just, and you utilizing it in the moment of stress, utilizing it in the moments of our lives when we need it, but use, utilizing it just every single day. I mean, part of my sleep bedtime routine is to do the four, seven, eight breathing, Dr. Andrew Wiles, four, seven, eight breathing. And I love it. And I will say, I also often on the car ride into the city, I live, I'm working in New York city car ride in, I 100% employ my four, seven, eight breathing. So even if meditation is not something you can do, and there's, we'll go over more things too, then we all breathe right? That's something we all do. So doing a good breath work and, and having that skill is the best thing possible. Even when you're in the moment of pain to pull back on that breath work, when you're really in that acute pain and utilizing it, 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 it's amazing for pain as well, not just stress management. I mean, that's the yeah. whole premise behind, you know, Lamaze, right? Um, it works. So, I mean, it works. And I, I like the box breathing. I like the suggestion yeah. that you had. I want to hear the other tips, but even if there's been times I've been writhing in pain, I'm sure there's people who are listening, but if you can even just lay on the floor, lay in your bed, put your, your hand on your stomach and your heart, and just try to get in 10, you will feel 10 deep breaths. You will feel the difference and just making that a practice on a daily, like you're saying, I've noticed a difference with that too. I was definitely never fully breathing before I started to get into yoga and meditation, but yes. So yeah. what are some of those, you said there was more tips, but I, I love those tips. <laughs> you know, it all depends on, on you. I think it's really important to choose what, what, you know, going through and saying that really jives with you. Right. Yeah. So, um, journaling, a lot of my patients like to journal, um, and they find it really therapeutic. That's how they end their day before they go to bed. They just get it all out on paper. So journaling is another great stress management skill, uh, and exercise exercise, you know, falls into two categories. It it definitely is stress management. Um, and it, it absolutely also is, uh, a great form of exercise for endometriosis and actually all pelvic pain type patients too, because there's so many positions that really are focused on, on pelvic pain and helping with the pelvic floor muscles, as well as the abdomen. Yeah. I go to initially. Yeah. I, I say to people too, even if it's just a walk, like mm -hmm. start with just walking around your house, then maybe walk around your, the perimeter of your home and then go around the block. I, I tell people all the time, sometimes I feel like the tin man probably because I've had so much surgery, but I do yoga and I strength train and it's made a huge difference in my life, specifically strength training. I've done yoga for years. Um, but strength training actually for me, and this may be very hard for people who are listening that are in a lot of pain and the days that you feel good has really reduced my pain. I, I just feel a lot stronger and I, and I'm able to do more from just lifting weights. Right. And I used to be do like crazy cardio, which I'm sure was not great for my inflammation. Um, but it's, I enjoyed it. So find something you enjoy doing and, and try it out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So 
diet, stress management, all these things we know. I really appreciate that you said it's different for everybody too, because there are so many, I don't do dairy. I don't do gluten. Everybody on the show knows that I don't do caffeine. I barely drink, but it's just because I notice it personally flares me up. Um, I have someone who comes on the show, Elva. She's from Ireland. She's on the show often. She can eat dairy and bread and you know it doesn't bother her but what's really interesting is she was in the U.S. over Thanksgiving and she said she was really struggling with the food and like reading the packaging because it is so different here so if if it's possible to finding the foods that have the least amount of ingredients if you are going to have something more processed because again all of those additives right are yeah. just going to inflame you more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, definitely no process. Definitely. You want to be able to read the ingredients and know what the words are and pronounce them. So if you're getting these words that you're like, what is that? And I don't know how to pronounce that. Don't put it in your body. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. So uh, endo, what other just, I'm just curious endo wise, like other maybe tips that you give patients that are a little more accessible if they're not in a place to be able to seek medical care right now or, or more holistic, are there any other things outside of those, you know, key pillars that you've talked about that you've seen be successful, like acupuncture or other kind of modalities? Acupuncture is wonderful and really, really helpful too, right? So it hits from a couple of different angles. It's going to hit with that stress. It's going to kind of help with blood flow in general. And then of course, it's also going to help with the cortisol levels, right? So if you're chronically in pain, you're going to have elevated cortisol levels too. So your body is just burning out, you know, on top of everything else, which is why often women who have endometriosis and chronically are in pain are just extremely fatigued too, because the amount of stress they've put on their body. So for such a long period of time, mm -hmm. so acupuncture is fantastic. There's actually even, um, you know, of, at no cost, actually, uh, it's Australian, the Australian pelvic pain society, I believe it is has online these like, um, eight exercises and they're essentially different like yoga positions, but the eight exercises, the whole routine is eight minutes and it's really, really helpful to do. And a lot of my patients will do that every morning as part of their routine. Um, and especially I, you know, for certain patients that really can't, their insurance doesn't cover and they can't afford pelvic physical therapy, because as you know, in our country, that's something that's hard to get covered. And, uh, so those are great too, and readily available resources. Um, and even on that note, there's a, you know, a couple of different, um, pelvic physical therapists, and even I'll send you this information if you want that actually do like online group things at a very, very low cost, you know, monthly cost. So that's really nice too, for a more, you know, financially affordable, uh, level. I think that, um, I think it's really important to, you know, to know your body and advocate for yourself. I think it'll put your, you in a much better mental position for approaching endometriosis. Um, and really focusing in on those pillars and making them as, as optimized as possible is great. You know, there are things that I also would encourage if really your pain is just not being able to be controlled. There's a lot of things I'm sure you touch on this too, that often go hand in hand, unfortunately, with endometriosis, you know, kind of the evil twins of endometriosis. Um, so, you know, IBS is one of them which I think often is sort of misdiagnosed, right? Because IBS is this large kind of garbage category where no man's land, right? Like the, yeah. the, 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 what's the, the land of the misfit toys, right? That's where you send. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, timely and appropriate. Uh, so, you know, I think that um, if you have the resources and available, then sometimes doing one of these gut microbiome testing and really looking at whether or not you have leaky gut or SIBO, or it also will tell you if you have not necessarily celiac, for example, right, but gluten sensitivity um, and just a good microbiome within the gut to really help with everything. Because it's so hard with being someone who suffers from endometriosis and then also concurrently having these like gastrointestinal issues and chronic constipation. Um, you don't know if your pain is coming from your endometriosis or coming from your gastrointestinal <laughs> issues. Or is it both of them at the same time? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. 
So, so I'm really interested to learn more about that test though, because I honestly, my, my gut health is still, I had part of my bowel removed because I had endo infiltrate through my bowel and I, not that I want to make this a medical appointment, but I know so many people who struggle just with either super nauseous or constipated or diarrhea. So I'm really curious about this test because I'm not familiar with it. How does, do you get this through a medical practice? How does it work? There's a few different companies that do it. You can always, you know, kind of order directly from the company and then mm -hmm. often can do consultations with the company um, that kind of go over your results with you and so on. Or all functional medicine doctors do it. Um, okay. And a lot of integrative medicine doctors do it as well. But they, there's a, is it okay to say company names or test yeah, names? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> For sure. Um, so I, I have no affiliation with anything. So yeah. <laughs> all about getting information to you. Yes. Um, there's um, one that's called GI Map. Um, there's the Gut Zoomer from Vibrant America. And those are two really often done tests and very validated tests and probably the best in the field to use of one of those two tests. Um, but I do find that a lot of women and not everyone, right. But a lot of women who really can't get on top of their endo symptoms and you know who you are, you know, if you yeah. have a lot of constipation, a lot of bloating, although endo causes bloating too, obviously, um, but excessive bloating and, uh, diarrhea, um, heartburn, even all those things you can really see, uh, with a gut microbiome test and then kind of rebalance that out. It's important too, because if the gut microbiome is off and if you have something like leaky gut, right? The term that's kind of thrown around a lot, but yes. that, that actually encourages inflammation too. So now you have two, you know, diseases that are creating inflammation in your body. Right. And that brings me to another question. I'm curious if you see this often is I also have Hashimoto's, but I interview a lot of patients who have multiple, they'll, you know, maybe endo and POTS or endo and Hashimoto's or other, I know endo is not autoimmune, but other right. potential like autoimmune disorders. I mean, do you see that often? Do you have any theories? Just yeah. like, I just, it's so interesting. I know they're all inflammation based. Do you think there's something there? Do you see that often too? Absolutely. I mean, I see it. I see pots a lot. I mean, I do, you know, I, there's no evidence behind this and it's just a curiosity I thing. Yeah. I do wonder if there's an element of autoimmune to endometriosis because, yeah. you know, it's often concurrent with, um, I see it a lot too with, um, with Sjogren's with lupus. I mean, all of the mm -hmm. autoimmune different ones. Yes. So you have to kind of wonder it's, it's, it, I know there's no research on it, but it's just something that because I interview so many people and I'm just like, there is a correlation here. Another thing I see a correlation with is like I mentioned earlier is just like a to tolerance for smells like, um, mm -hmm. perfumes or like if someone's putting fertilizer on the lawn, like more chemical base smells, and then also medications. And when I think of like functional medicine, I think, I'm guessing that some of these things are like, are maybe when your system's inflamed or your endocrine system is like just so many disruptors that you become super sensitive to mm -hmm. that. Is that what, you know, in functional medicine, is there anything that correlates those things? I've never seen anything discussed about that. I've seen that too. Um, yeah. I'm not sure my working theories, which obviously are not evidence-based at this point, right. are whether it comes from the inflammatory aspect or whether it comes from the higher levels of estrogen in a woman who has endometriosis. And if you think about it, right, when a woman is pregnant, what is she? She's intolerant to smell. She's intolerant to perfumes. Uh, everything's very sensitive. Medications, everything, you know, makes it worse. So you yeah. kind of wonder too, whether there, whether estrogen is, whether it's the inflammation or whether it's the, actually the estrogen, the higher levels yeah. of estrogen that are causing that. That's really interesting. And again, I, these are not, these are just like high concept things yeah. that come across all the time and just you know, curious if you see them too, because I find it to be interesting. I talk to so many people and I'm just like, there is something here. I don't know what it is. So that makes sense. I mean, even like morning sickness, right? Like oh, a lot yeah. of people with endo are very nauseous in the morning. So mm -hmm. I, I do see correlations there for sure. Um, and then as far as supplements, just high, like a high level 
what would you recommend for people who have endometriosis? We don't have to say brands or anything. People can research on their own, but you know, are there like five that you are like, everybody should be considering taking these supplements? Mm. So, um, I do tend to tailor, but I will give you a few that, that everyone really should be taking, right? So a a good B complex is incredibly important, right? So we know the data and you kind of extrapolate the data. We know the data for B vitamins and, and dysmenorrhea or painful periods, right? And when the data was being done, it wasn't about endometriosis painful periods. It was about women in general with painful periods. But if you extrapolate that, then the same theory should work for endometriosis. So a good B vitamin for everyone is incredibly important. Magnesium. So magnesium, I will say everyone and not just endo, right? I actually believe that every human being should be on magnesium, but magnesium. And I think that with magnesium, there's, there's lots of different types. You kind of want to tailor it to your other symptoms too. For example, if you're somebody who has lots of headaches, um, in addition to endometriosis, then you are going to want to go more for magnesium L3 and 8, right? Because magnesium L3 and 8 crosses the blood brain barrier. If you're someone who has a lot of constipation, then magnesium citrate and magnesium citrate is helpful with constipation. If you're someone in general who doesn't really have any of those issues and just uh, either A, wants a good magnesium supplement or B, um, has endometriosis and wants to help manage symptoms, then magnesium glycinate is the most bioavailable magnesium, which means that what you're taking in is what your body's actually getting. Because a lot of times in the metabolism of these supplements, your body's not getting that 300 milligram dosage that you think you're getting. So magnesium glycinate is kind of the blanket magnesium that everyone does well with. Magnesium citrate, which I find a lot of women come in on because they've done the research and they're ready for it. Unfortunately, if you do not have constipation, magnesium citrate is not the right choice because on top of everything else, you now have the opposite, right? You have diarrhea. (laughs) And who wants that? I laugh because I take two magnesium citrate every night and it does not, it doesn't do that to me. So I'm on the other spectrum of the right. constipation, constipation, but I will tell you, I sleep like a rock with that. Yeah. When you talked about sleep, that was one of the things I was going to mention is I take two of those before bed and I swear it helps me sleep through the night when I used to be one of the people that would like wake up and be up from one to three, like making a to-do list. I mean, magnesium so. has so many benefits. It's involved with over 300 enzymatic pathways of the body. Um, but, you know, it's involved with, with pain and mm-hmm. at the, and then actually the level of the neurons too. It's involved with muscle recovery, uh, which our uterus is a muscle, right? And then it's also, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, right? Which is our rest and digest, which is why you want to take your magnesium at night, because you get the added benefit of exactly what you just said, right? You take it, it kind of, to me, when I take it, I take it every night. Um, it kind of, to me, feels like the equivalent of like a half a glass of wine, right? Like you don't feel loopy and out of it, but all of a sudden you're like, ah, oh, okay, that broke, that anxiety broke a little bit. And good night. Yeah. Yes, good night. Yeah. <laughs> and I will, I, there's a noticeable difference personally that I notice when I do, when I skip my magnesium at night, my sleep yes. is never as good. So again, that goes back to one of the original pillars, right? So magnesium will help with sleep too. Um, right. so right. definitely magnesium, definitely be complex. And then I think that it's a very good idea for most women to consider, you know, curcumin, um, really a wonderful anti-inflammatory, Uh, And there's so many products in the market. And obviously, you know, if you want to consume it, that's great. But if you're going to consume it, you're going to consume it with also pepper, obviously, to make it work better. Um, And those three are definitively, there are some interesting, there's actually some interesting data um, on melatonin and endometriosis. Um, And this I say, as just education and caution, because it, it could obviously make a lot of women too tired the next morning, right? Sure. But the data is on a high dosing of melatonin. And when you get to a higher dose of melatonin, it actually acts as an antioxidant to the body. 
So when you're on those little dosage, right, that people take the, that are three or, you know, or one even, or, you know, the big dose is five, then okay. those ones really act for initiating sleep and sleep. Right. When you're on dosages that are, and the study that was done, I, I want to say it was done in 2016 or 18, I'm blanking right now, but that, that dosage is actually 20 and they actually studied it in women with endometriosis and found it to be work as a, as a, as an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory at that level for them. So that I caution and I say, but it is something yeah. that you want to, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because there aren't a lot of supplements that were studied for endometriosis. Right. Right. And that's really interesting. So yeah, everyone should look that up. I highly encourage that's thank you for pointing that out. I have not heard that. So that's the first time I've heard that. That's really good to know. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about perimenopause and menopause and people with endometriosis potentially going through this um, hysterectomy is not a cure, but a lot of people who have endometriosis also have adenomyosis. And that is the cure for adenomyosis is a hysterectomy. So people may be going through perimenopause slash menopause early and, or may just be getting to that age and have endometriosis. Do you treat those patients? I'm assuming obviously the answer is yes, differently, but do you see any trends or any tips for people who might be going through that at this particular time? Yeah, I think it's a, that's a great question. And I think that there's absolutely no, no knowledge out there, no information about this. Of so course. <laughs> I will say that, um, so the assumption, right, let's start off with just perimenopause in perimenopause, the, in the beginning of perimenopause, what first starts to decline is testosterone levels, right? And testosterone just kind of gradually declines. What then happens is actually progesterone drops down and progesterone has a dramatic drop down. Now, if you're someone who does not have endometriosis during this time in your life, you don't A, think you're in perimenopause. You don't know it because you think perimenopause is I'm missing periods. I'm hot flashing. I have vaginal dryness and that's not the symptoms you have. So women don't even know that that's part of perimenopause. Um, but if you're someone, for example, who does not have endometriosis during this time, you may have worsening PMS, heavier periods, longer lasting periods, maybe some random spotting that goes on too, mixed into the mix, um, breast tenderness, irritability, weight gain, or even just difficulty losing weight, doing the same things that you used to work for you. And these are all signs for someone who does not, right? Lovely, does not have endometriosis. Right, it was just sounds like a real <laughs> fun time. <laughs> now factor in, and I see this day in and day out because my other niche and specialty, as you know, is perimenopause, menopause. Yep. Um, and day in and day out, I will have women come in in their 40s, even early 40s, who are all of a sudden have a diagnosis of endometriosis. And it's fascinating, right? Because you're traditionally taught in, in residency and medical school that it is diagnosed 20s, 30s, even teens sometimes. And it is not something in your 40s, it's not endometriosis. If you all of a sudden have painful periods, it is not endometriosis. Right. And it actually is because what happens going back to the similarity. So endometriosis is, is essentially, you know, an estrogen driven disease, right? That estrogen and inflammation. And then you've entered into the early stages of perimenopause where your body's not producing enough progesterone to balance out the estrogen. And you're not producing more estrogen. You're just not producing more progesterone anymore. Right. So your balance so, yeah. is off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So for your body's perception, it just sees estrogen, more and more estrogen. So now you're feeding that endometriosis. So I've had quite a few patients and I've even had a very close friend who all of a sudden got diagnosed with endometriosis in their early forties because it, it was enough, right? You got to a certain breaking point that your body's like too much estrogen and I'm symptomatic now. Um, so that's something to really think about during this time as you, as you go through your life with your hormones kind of getting prepped and ready to go that if you're someone for example who's not on a birth control pill or any of the medications then your hormones may what worked for you for example in your 30s to kind of manage it naturally may not work in your 40s anymore and it's not you it's the fact that your estrogen no longer has that progesterone to balance out and that's that's early perimenopause now fortunately <laughs> 
um, for endometriosis women, late perimenopause is actually a reprieve often for endometriosis because at that point, your estrogen now has dropped down. You have no estrogen. What I do see a lot, and I see this with women who had, like you mentioned, um, definitive surgical management for their endometriosis in their 40s um, and then are kind of put into surgically induced menopause. Mm-hmm. And also women who never had a hysterectomy or surgery and just went through menopause naturally, that they then opt to go on, you know, hormone replacement therapy because they are symptomatic with their menopause type symptoms. Um, and of course, you're traditionally taught that if you don't have a uterus, you don't need progesterone with your hormone replacement therapy. You can just take estrogen. So what do you think happens? <laughs> and this just Whoa. happens. She, a couple of days ago to me, I had this lovely woman come in endometriosis. She's 42 years old, had definitive surgical management, um, and was very, very symptomatic because, you know, surgically induced menopause is much more dramatic than natural menopause. It's <laughs> right. Like I'm sure natural menopause, you're like on a scale of like, you know, a bell yeah. curve, almost where you're going up where I've obviously that yeah. is immediate. So my guess is that her estrogen was very high or not high. It was her progesterone went really low and she was very symptomatic for endometriosis. Yeah. So what happened was she was, she had a hysterectomy. She had both ovaries removed too. She went to surgically induced menopause. She had her symptoms. She was put on an estrogen only therapy for her hormone replacement therapy. And all of a sudden she was having that crampy lower abdominal pains, beginnings of symptoms that she says were similar to what her endometriosis symptoms are, right? So something to keep in mind is that if you're someone who has endometriosis and you go through menopause, either surgically induced or natural, and you wanna go on hormone replacement therapy, then you are someone advocate for yourself who needs progesterone. Yes. Yes. Progesterone will help balance out that estrogen. So you don't have, cause you can on estrogen only therapy, you can regrow your endometriosis implants. Oh, there's people that have been in menopause. I haven't had anyone on the show, but that I've talked to that had horrible sciatic, they, they had never maybe been, maybe they were diagnosed, but never really managed it. But then later in menopause started to have really bad cramping and, and sciatic pain. And, and some of these other things just start to manifest even after they hadn't had a cycle for 12 months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, menopause, I mean, and also that's just one of those like endo myths too, like menopause is a cure for endometriosis <laughs> and it's not right. And there's a hysterectomy, like you still can grow it. So if someone theoretically has endometriosis and they're only taking estrogen, they could really start to regrow that endo, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That, and it's not talked about very often at all, perimenopause, menopause, just in general in society. But then when you add this estrogen dominant disease on top of it, yeah, I feel like the thought process is that, you know, endo is a disease of your 20s and 30s and then yeah. and then you're done with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could just let that one go once you hit 40. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. So, I feel like that's very helpful. So, for anyone who may be starting to go through perimenopause and or menopause and they have endo, um you think that they should go, like they should advocate with their doctor if they're having really bad symptoms to make sure that they have both progesterone and estrogen. Yes. And I will say that most physicians, it's just not that they're, it's just a lack of knowledge. They just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And I think going back to lack of knowledge and with you being a physician, a lot of times when patients are starting on their journey, and I want to hear what you do at the beginning of a journey with someone who may be younger, like in their teens or twenties, if you have those patients, but when they're going to their either PCP or their OBGYN in the beginning, it's just a, it's a lack of knowledge there, right. About this disease. I feel like the awareness is getting better, but sometimes I still have patients on the show that are in their twenties that went to their normal OBGYN and they're just we're never even mentioned the word endometriosis. Mm -hmm. The word is still sometimes not even mentioned to those patients, even though they are presenting 
with what I would say at this point, I could diagnose as symptoms of endometriosis. Mm -hmm. So you still think it's just a lack of knowledge in the, in the beginning of, of just, I don't know, I guess OBGYN, it's just not a focus. Yeah. I think it's also the questions that we don't ask, right? So every single person that comes in, right. I think a lot of women think that, you know, nobody's period is fun. (laughs) So, so my, my painful period is probably what everyone else is feeling. And it's just, that's normal. And I think that, um, every annual, every annual that I, that I do, for example, with my patients, I always ask certain questions and I'll ask, obviously if they're menstruating, I'll ask about their periods and not, you know, when's the last period and how often is your cycle? Yes, of course, those questions, right. but I'll say, I mean, do you have pain with your period? Do you find that you're missing school work events because of your period? And is that a recurrent thing. And if I hear yes to those things, that's not normal, right? Everyone has uh, cramping their first day, got to take some Advil, maybe kind of want to have a heating pad a little bit. Don't really feel like going out, but just because I'm tired. Um, But if you're missing work, if you're missing school, if there's an event you want to go to and you are not going to it, that is not normal. And I think that there's an issue on two sides, right? I think that patients are kind of intimidated by their doctors and they don't push it forward. Um, And on the patient end too, you, you and your head have normalized this. And so you don't think it's something worth bringing up. And then on the physician side, it is our job to ask questions that you don't even think you have. Right. Um, And we're not doing that either. And that's kind of the issue with, with the dynamics. Yeah. And I always say, I I think it's a lot better, right? I've been dealing with this for 25 years and I, I do feel like things have gotten so much better. There is still so much more to do, but just on the, my side, I totally thought it was normal because my grandmother had really bad cramps and she told, she, you know, comforted me and said, I'm so sorry you have to deal with this. I had the same thing. So I never discussed it with my friends, right? I never, until I started missing things and my friends were confused about it in high school. Like, what what do you mean you're that sick that you can't attend X, Y, Z is when I started to really be like, Hmm, I think there's something more going on here, but it's not like you're openly talking about your period or your cycle with other people. And that's the whole like kind of taboo part about it too. So then when you get to your doctor, maybe you're a little nervous or embarrassed and you're not going to say, or for me, I'm, oh, it's not that bad. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Right. Like I, I remember saying that like, yeah, it was bad, but I didn't want to make it feel like I needed the extra attention or something, you know, just being not forthright enough. And that's one thing I always tell patients and for people who listen to the show is you have to advocate and keep a data log and you got to fight. Sometimes you have to fight for it. It shouldn't be that way, but sometimes we still have to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, well, it, I want to hear about when a patient comes to see you, you know, what do you do? What are your, because there may be people listening who may want to talk to you and reach out to you. And I know, you know, you're practicing in New York, but you offer some online services as well. So tell us a little bit about, you know, those things in case people want to find you. Yeah, of course. So yeah, when, um, when I first see an initial patient, um, I, it's really important to me first and foremost, that I understand what her goals are, right. And what her, her desires are. And I'll even ask a basic question, you know, do you want a traditional approach? Do you want a more natural approach or do you want an integrative? You want the combination of the two, the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the woman to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, I've noticed a lot in, um, in social media and in general, that I feel like a lot of physicians become very, um, what is the right word? I guess kind of, I view it as patriarchal, right? Just tell you what you should be doing. And, you, you know, birth control pills are horrible. Birth control pills are the only thing. It's just, it's very, it's very Matter cold. Fact. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's not how it should be, right? You need to be heard. It's your body. You're going to, you're the one living with this and you just right. want the most amount of information, the most amount of education and guidance, but, but not, not rules 
right? Yeah. Um, so I always go into the full, full history, full menstrual history, full everything history. I actually go through someone's, you know, daily nutrition. Um, I go through somebody's um, exercise, their sleep, the supplements they're currently taking, their stress management skills, um, as well as sex, right? You have to really go into whether or not they have pain with sex, whether it's deep, whether it's on insertion, whether whether sex is enjoyable, whether they're able to achieve yeah. orgasm. Um, so all of those things you are, comp are involved in the initial, and it takes a while, right, to get all that information. And then to really zero in on, again, culminating with what are your goals? What do you want out of everything? And how do you want to approach this? Um, again, because I am kind of traditional, integrative and functional. Um, and when I say functional and integrative, you know, I, I, I believe still in evidence-based modalities, but I believe that there's still things that, you know, research has not caught up with and women in general for, for science research, women in general are actually not studied as much as men. So yeah. you're starting right there from the very beginning. Yep. Um, so things that, you know, you kind of can extrapolate and that makes sense and understanding the way that things work and being able to apply it with the knowledge of what the disease is. I'm okay with using things that are a little bit, you know, there's not studies for it, but listen, it makes sense because of this, this, and that. Right. Um, but, um, and then you put it all together, a really good examination, right? Really important for you're someone who has pelvic pain to have the right examination. If your doctor's jumping in, just putting the speculum in, <laughs> doing what we call biomass, <laughs> right? Yes. Which is and everything, um, then that's not the right approach either, right? You want to be able to do a full body examination. You really want to see if the hips align. You want to examine the back, examine the abdomen. Um, I'm sure you've had it, but the Q-tip test I always do too, uh, as well as evaluate the pelvic floor muscles and then do a really comprehensive examination, a, a, a bimanual examination. And I think one of the issues with endometriosis and it not being diagnosed for a long time too, is that we're taught that it's a surgically diagnosed disease right? You need pathology that says you have endometriosis. So then you go into a couple of different issues. The first issue is that that's requiring you to have surgery, to have a diagnosis, which a lot of women don't want to have surgery. And a lot of women who are in their twenties are petrified of it because why would they have had surgery otherwise, right? Up until that point. Um, and then even if you have surgery and this is, this is very negative and I'm so sorry, this should not, this should not be a downer, but even if you have surgery, if you don't choose the right surgeon, in general, the ability to visually detect endometriosis is about 60%, right? Which is pretty bad odds in my opinion. So unless you have a doctor who A, visually looks, but then B, does biopsies regardless of all the areas that endometriosis could possibly be for the most part, right? We know they could be every area of your body actually, but at least the most common areas of where endometriosis is, then even if the pathology comes back, you know, if you know, if you've, I've had a lot of women who are like, well, I had two laparoscopies. They told me I didn't have endometriosis. Did they do biopsies? No, they looked and said there was no endometriosis. So you really also want to have the right surgeon and you want to make sure that there's biopsies. And even on a woman's behalf, you can say, listen, when you do the laparoscopy, even if everything looks normal, can you please do, you know, a series of biopsies too? Just so we have the pathology saying that there's no endometriosis. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I, I think that's going to bring a lot of comfort to people who are listening. It really will, because there's been many people who are afraid to get surgery and or have had surgery and told they didn't have an, they don't have endometriosis and they probably did not do pathology. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you for saying that. So, so you see people in the office and, mm -hmm. but you also have some online offerings too, correct? Yeah, but I still do telehealth that has stayed since COVID. <laughs> yeah. It's here to stay for everybody, which I actually think is a great thing. Yeah. Um, and um, and then I do also these group programs and they're usually by Zoom. Um, and you don't have to be a patient of the practice to do them. They're educational. So they're not going to obviously be giving you personalized you know, uh, rules, but they will give you kind of the education behind things, general recommendations and so on. Um, and I do them kind of, I like to do problem-based programs. So I'll do endometriosis. I'll do perimenopause. Uh, a lot of people actually like them too, because similarly, it kind of creates this community too. Yeah. You know, outside of me, it creates a community. Yeah. 
No. And I, I, I really appreciate that. And follow, tell everyone your social channels because I follow you and I actually find your content to be very helpful. Um, and I think people will appreciate it. So I'll link everything in the show notes as well, but I think you're providing helpful information and I think everyone appreciates that so much, but for everyone who's listening and they want to find you, how do they find you? Thank you so much. So my Instagram is uh, Tara MD. So MD, the number four women. Um, and my website's TaraMD.com. <laughs> so Easy peasy. Yeah, yeah. T-A-R-A. <laughs> and I'll link it to, is there anything else that you want to say or that we didn't chat about or you think was helpful for patients or did we miss anything in our, in our conversation? I feel like we could talk for four hours about I this. Know, I feel the same thing. I think, <laughs> I think we have a good starting point. <laughs> yeah. We have a good starting point, yeah. but anything that we missed or that you want to add in or before we wrap up? No, but you know, I actually am thankful to my endometriosis patients, honestly, because for me, I feel like you know, it, it doesn't make it any easier for the pain that they've gone through, but because of my endometriosis patients, I went on to do much more extensive training, um, which has helped so many other women in all kinds of different problems. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't make it any easier to live day in, day out with pain. Um, but it's, they, they've been an inspiration to me. Well, that's really kind. And your empathy shows and going, you've gone above and beyond to really figure out from every angle, how to help people with this disease. So for me and the community, we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still so much to learn now. (laughs) I know one day at a time, one day at a time. Thank you so much, Dr. Fensky, for um, being with us tonight or today, whenever you're listening to this, everyone, and sharing all of this wisdom with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a wonderful night.